In just 72 hours, Lake Oroville's water surged 23 feet, an event so abrupt and unaccountable that veteran engineers admit it defies anything in the official playbook. Hard proof from elevation records and lab-analyzed sediment samples signals something beneath the surface that textbook storms cannot explain. If the cause of this surge remains hidden, the consequences could reach far beyond California. So how does a reservoir leap nearly two stories almost overnight? And what is really forcing emergency teams into uncharted territory? At the heart of the controversy sits a single, undeniable record, the official elevation chart for Lake Oroville, stamped and time-coded by the California Department of Water Resources. Over a three-day window, the line on the graph does not just climb. It bends sharply upward, tracing a 23-foot leap that takes the reservoir from 766 feet to 789 feet above sea level. The timestamps tell their own story. On Saturday at 6 a.m., the surface stands at 766 feet. By Tuesday morning, the reading locks in at 789 feet. Each tick on the axis is backed by sensor arrays calibrated for flood control, used by dam operators and hydrologists for decades. This is not a rounding error or a fluke of measurement. The rise equates to hundreds of thousands of acre feet of new water, enough to supply Los Angeles for months, appearing in a span usually reserved for slow seasonal melt or the tail end of a record storm. The official logs, released daily, show no sign of malfunction or recalibration during this period. Inflows, tracked at the main Feather River intake, spike above 89,000 cubic feet per second at the surge's peak, numbers that dwarf the reservoir's typical winter averages. The graph's curve, once predictable, now breaks every projection made at the start of the season. Water managers accustomed to gradual changes confront a rise that pushes the lake to 102% of its historical average in a single burst. The raw telemetry leaves little room for debate. The 789-foot mark is not a projection or a model. It is a measured fact, confirmed by redundant sensors and cross-checked against manual gauge readings. For those who rely on the reservoir, farmers, city planners, and millions of residents downstream, the numbers on this chart are more than data points. They are the first warning that something extraordinary has altered the course of California's most vital water supply. At 5.30 in the morning on January 14th, a custody form logged the arrival of fresh water samples at the regional testing lab. The lead analyst, Dr. Lena Morales, began her review with a standard protocol, filtering, entering, centrifuging, and then scanning for mineral content using inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. Each sample came tagged with precise coordinates and depth, drawn from multiple points along the Feather River inflow and the lake's upper basin. The results delivered a familiar signature, silica, calcium, and iron, all within expected ranges for Sierra Nevada runoff. But when Dr. Morales compared the new data to historical baselines, every reading fell in line with what is typically seen after major winter storms. No spikes in trace elements, no evidence of rare earths, and no sign of minerals that would point to a deep earth origin. The lab's instruments, calibrated to detect even parts per billion, found nothing out of the ordinary. Magnesium and potassium hovered at levels consistent with surface erosion while barium and vanadium, often flagged as markers of groundwater upwelling, registered below detection thresholds. Chain of custody records show the samples moved from field technicians to the lab without interruption. The paperwork, signed and time-stamped, rules out contamination or mislabeling. Dr. Morales's final report, filed just before noon, notes that sediment and dissolved mineral content match established profiles for post-storm inflows and that no anomalies were detected. Instead of confirming rumors about a mysterious source, this is a Sony Dishkam Robbies, the physical evidence points downward, 
but only as far as the topsoil and fractured rock layers that feed the watershed during heavy rains. The mineral profile reads like a fingerprint of the Sierra's winter runoff. Nothing more, nothing less. For now, the search for answers moves away from chemical clues and toward the unseen forces beneath the surface. At 6.12 a.m. on January 15th, a drone lifted off from the south shore of Lake Oroville, its flight path logged and time-stamped by the operator Marcus Lee, a veteran with more than a decade of reservoir surveillance experience. The mission was routine on paper, a sweep of the upper basin checking for debris and ice after the storm. But as the drone's thermal camera swept the water's surface, a distinct patch of heat appeared near the mid-lake coordinates, unexpected and out of place. The temperature difference registered at 4 degrees Celsius above the surrounding water, a margin too large to dismiss as morning sun or shallow runoff. Marcus radioed the control center and read the coordinates twice to confirm. The automated logs captured every detail, altitude, camera angle, and the precise moment the thermal anomaly flared on the screen. He circled the area twice, ruling out engine exhaust, nearby boats, or surface disturbance. No visible plume, no obvious source, just a silent patch of warmth radiating through the mist. Standard sensors anchored to buoys and shore stations showed nothing out of the ordinary. Water temperature at the surface matched seasonal averages, and the deepest readings stayed steady. Yet the drone's camera, designed for wildfire detection, recorded a hot spot that stretched nearly 60 yards across, holding steady for over 10 minutes before fading as the wind shifted. The flight log filed at the operations trailer triggered a request for additional subsurface sampling. If heat was seeping up from below, it could point to a hidden current or even a geological vent, phenomena missed by traditional monitoring. For the first time since the surge began, attention shifted from the surface to the unknown depths beneath the lake, and the search for answers moved beyond routine protocols. The next step would require tools and expertise, not usually called for in winter flood management. Dr. Alan Wirth, a hydrologist with 20 years of experience studying California's watersheds, scanned the latest telemetry from Lake Oroville and shook his head. The numbers did not add up. Rain gauges across the Feather River Basin had registered just over two inches during the surge window, well below the thresholds that usually trigger major reservoir spikes. Upstream, snowpack levels were stable, and the tributary gauges posted routine readings. Yet the lake's surface had climbed 23 feet in three days, a volume increase that should have required a deluge, not a modest winter storm. Wirth pulled up the inflow data from the main Feather River intake. At the peak, the sensors clocked 89,000 cubic feet per second. An impressive surge, but still within the range for a strong atmospheric river event. The problem was scale. To fill the reservoir by hundreds of thousands of acre feet in such a short span, the watershed would have needed sustained record-breaking rainfall or a rapid early season snowmelt. Neither had occurred. The official precipitation logs kept by the California Data Exchange Center showed nothing out of the ordinary. Even the most aggressive runoff models designed to predict floods from back-to-back -back storms could not account for the sheer volume now recorded in Oroville's basin. Worth's colleagues at the university reviewed the data independently. They checked for upstream diversions, sudden dam releases, and even the possibility of measurement error. Each avenue led back to the same conclusion. The water had arrived too quickly to be explained by known sources. The Feather River's upstream reservoirs were steady, and the snowpack remained locked in place by cold temperatures. No satellite images revealed hidden tributaries or flash floods. As the discrepancy grew larger, Worth began to question the limits of surface hydrology. If rainfall and snowmelt could not explain the surge, the answer had to lie somewhere beneath the obvious. The possibility of a subsurface process, something happening below the lake bed, could no longer be dismissed. The search for answers was about to move from the surface to the depths, and the next set of clues would come 
not from rainfall charts, but from the ground itself. At 2.22 in the afternoon on January 15th, the USGS seismic station at Oroville registered a tremor deep beneath the reservoir. The signal, plotted on the seismogram, showed a low-frequency pulse centered at a depth of roughly 400 feet below the lake floor, far deeper than the shallow quakes sometimes triggered by rapid reservoir filling. Dr. Karen Lee, a seismologist with the USGS Sacramento office, reviewed the waveform from her lab that afternoon. The event lasted only a few seconds, but was strong enough to register above the background noise. A subtle jolt that did not match the aftershocks of distant tectonic movement or the rhythmic hum of hydroelectric turbines. The timing caught her attention. The tremor arrived just hours after the latest surge in lake elevation, and its depth placed it well below the fractured rock layers that typically shift during heavy inflows. Standard protocols flagged the reading for further review. Dr. Lee compared the trace to historical records from the past decade. Most local seismic activity had been shallow and scattered, often linked to seasonal changes in water level. This one was different, isolated, deeper, and lacking the sharp onset of a tectonic slip. She ruled out quarry blasts or heavy equipment vibrations. She cross-referenced the event with the regional operations log. Nothing on the surface explained the signal. The data set off a quiet chain of phone calls between the USGS and the Department of Water Resources. While the tremor posed no immediate danger, its depth and timing raised new questions about the unseen forces at work beneath Lake Oroville. Dr. Lee drafted a brief for her colleagues, noting the need for additional monitoring and a possible review of subsurface pathways that could connect groundwater systems to the reservoir. The seismic blip, though small, hinted at a process unfolding out of sight, a reminder that not all the answers would be found at the surface. As the technical teams weighed their next steps, the focus shifted from rainfall and runoff to the mysterious mechanics of the earth below. At 9.45 in the morning, cell phones in Gridley and Oroville lit up with a brief message. The alert said, monitor official updates, flood risk possible, no action required. The notice came from the Butte County Office of Emergency Management, and it was the first public sign that local authorities were watching the reservoir's rapid rise with growing concern. In the County Emergency Operations Center, manager Paul Sue reviewed the latest inflow data and radioed field teams to check low-lying levees. He did not order evacuations but he did request a readiness drill and mapped alternate routes for neighborhoods closest to the Feather River, just in case the trend continued. By 10.30 in the morning, a filing crossed the desk of Angela Reyes, Regional Energy Coordinator for Pacific Grid. The notice authorized a temporary reroute of power generation away from the Hyatt power plant, and it shifted load to backup turbines downstream. The move was not dramatic enough to trigger public statements, but it did ripple through the state's energy grid. Hydroelectric output from Oroville dropped just as demand for flood control releases edged higher, a balancing act that required close coordination between water managers and utility operators. This grid reroute was a quiet but significant precaution. Meanwhile, at the Oroville Water Treatment Facility, Operations Chief Maria Hernandez doubled the frequency of water quality sampling. Her team, accustomed to testing every four hours, switched to two-hour intervals. The new protocol meant more staff on site and faster lab turnaround, with each sample logged and time-stamped for the state's environmental records. Hernandez briefed her crew on what to look for, sudden changes in turbidity, unexpected mineral spikes, or anything suggesting the inflow was carrying more than just stormwater runoff. The emphasis was on rapid sampling and careful documentation. These moves unfolded quietly, without the drama of sirens or roadblocks. But they marked a shift from routine monitoring to active readiness. Each decision, an alert, a grid reroute, a change in sampling, carried the weight of recent history and the knowledge that in a reservoir as vital as Oroville, small actions can make the difference between a close call and a crisis. For the officials making these calls, 
the numbers on the charts had become more than data. They were a signal to prepare for the unknown, even as the official message to the public remained calm and measured. In February 2017, Lake Oroville became the center of national attention when a damaged spillway forced the evacuation of 188,000 people living downstream. Helicopters dropped bags of rock into a gaping hole, and emergency crews worked around the clock to prevent a disaster. The event left scars, physical and psychological, that linger across the Sacramento Valley. Repairs cost over a billion dollars, and for months, the future of the reservoir was in question. Today, the numbers are even larger. Lake Oroville supplies water to 3.5 million Californians, stretching from rice paddies in the north to suburbs and businesses hundreds of miles away. The dam holds back up to 3.5 million acre-feet of water, enough to submerge entire counties if released uncontrolled. Every chart and sensor reading is scrutinized, each decision measured against the memory of that winter when the warning sirens sounded without warning. For those managing the lake, the past is not just a lesson, it is a warning. The stakes have only grown as drought cycles tighten and the margin for error shrinks. Official statements assure the public that the infrastructure is sound, but the shadow of 2017 hangs over every surge, every unexplained spike in the charts. The question is no longer just about engineering. It is about trust and what happens when the numbers on the page hint at risks no one can afford to ignore. Pressure mounted when a leaked internal memo surfaced on December 26, 2025. The document, addressed to Department of Water Resources Management, referenced a persistent anomaly in inflow readings and called for expanded monitoring ahead of any public disclosure. Yet the first official notice to the public came nearly three weeks later, raising questions about transparency and oversight. The gap between internal awareness and public communication became a flashpoint for local leaders and advocacy groups who demanded a full accounting of the timeline and decision-making process. In response, a Department of Water Resources spokesperson announced the rollout of a new borehole sensor array scheduled to begin installation on January 17, 2026. The monitoring lead described the plan. A grid of deep sensors will be drilled along the lake's perimeter, designed to capture subsurface movement and temperature shifts that existing equipment might miss. This expansion, promised in direct response to the memo's findings, was presented as a step toward restoring public confidence. Calls for an independent audit gained momentum. Community members and regional officials pressed for outside experts to review both the data and the agency's handling of the surge. As the debate intensified, the focus shifted from the mystery of the water's origin to the systems meant to track and explain it. Today, Lake Oroville's data is public. Its systems transparent and official records show no unexplained crisis, just the relentless scrutiny that comes with managing California's most vital water source. As droughts intensify and trust in institutions frays, the real test isn't, this test isn't just infrastructure, it's whether facts can outpace fear. The next surge may not be in the water, but in public demand for truth. Share your thoughts below.